Welcome to Sustainability as a Practice, Creating Truly Local Pottery with David McMillan, present, presented by the Manitoba Craft Council. Please welcome David in the live chat. Uh, the Manitoba Craft Council was founded in 1978 as Manitoba's only not-for-profit arts organization dedicated exclusively to contemporary craft. The Manitoba Craft Council is located in Winnipeg within Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Ishinabe, Ojibwe, Inanu, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota, and is the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis Nation homeland. The purpose of the MCC is to promote, develop, and advocate for contemporary craft and its makers in Manitoba. For over 40 years, the organization has worked to ensure that contemporary craft and the artists who produce it are supported, recognized, and celebrated for their contribution to the culture and economic life in Manitoba. In these challenging times, the Manitoba Craft Council is proud to produce programming to help artists, craftspeople, and makers adapt with the rapid and continuing changes in our community. For, for more information about becoming a member of the Manitoba Craft Council, please check out our website in the description. Uh, David McMillan was born in Brandon, Manitoba. Moving west, he completed his BFA with honors at Emily Carr University of Art and Design, focusing on critical theory and contemporary ceramics. In the summers, he lived in a tent under an old growth cedar tree and learned production pottery in a four year internship. After returning to Manitoba, David has spent over a decade working exclusively with locally harvested materials in his ceramics. Everything that goes into David's pots is dug by hand in Manitoba. The different clays and sands are each carefully researched and then harvested. All processing is done by hand before the materials are combined to make different clays that he throws on his kick wheel. The glazes on his work come from wood ash and different rocks that are crushed by hand. The final step is for David to fire the pots in his wood burning kiln with trees that are sustainably harvested from his own woodlot. David will guide us through his research harvest and processing of natural materials in Manitoba for his pottery. Each material that he uses has a story, geological history, biome, and personality. David's land-based practice is deeply rooted in and pays homage to the land he calls home. Please type any questions you may have into the chat and they'll be answered at a Q&A after the presentation. Um, and I'll hand it over to you, Dave. Great, thanks Katrina. <laughs> yeah, so thank you all for taking the time to, yeah, come and learn about how I choose to work with my clay. Um, I will try and pay attention to the chat. Um, just if you've got something that comes up in the presentation, please put it in there. Katrina will answer at the end, but I may pull it out and actually answer it in the presentation if you want. So yeah, just let me know I'm not speaking to a screen and yeah, say hi and ask any questions you want. Great. So. So today I'm going to go over uh, how I got where I am, uh, building and firing of my wood kiln, how I harvest and process and test my natural materials, my clay bodies, my glazes, and yeah, I will go over this process and I hope this talk really inspires people to take a look at their own process and honestly assess their environmental impacts. Uh, it's a big part of my work, which you're going to see. So this is a couple of my recent mugs. Um, this is local pottery. Um, I was asked to talk about sustainability, but I really don't know if my work is sustainable. I, I think the word sustainability is overused. I, I don't know how people can make work about sustainability while making pieces from inherently unsustainable materials. It's just, it doesn't compute for me. So that's what this talk is going to be about, is about how I try and make things as sustainable as I can. But from the description at the beginning, it, sustainability is a practice. I mean, I'm, I'm not perfect. Um, I'm trying the best I can, but by no means am I there yet. And I don't think anybody is ever there. We just we're trying the best we can. And so I don't want to be accusatory. I don't want to call people out on things, but at the same time, I am going to draw a pretty hard line 
on what I would use that word for. So I try to decrease the depth of my environmental footprint as much as I can. And I'm always trying to do better and I'm always trying to learn as much as I can. Um, if you look at one of my pieces and if I can look at one of my pieces and know that I took all the precautions I could and that I can still look at myself in the mirror after I'm done making it and say that I did my best, then I consider it successful. I like words like regional, um, locally, spe locally specific, bioregional. Those are the words that I like. Sustainable is just it's a little problematic for me. But before we get into my process, I need to go into the reasons why I go to all this effort. The entire presentation is not going to be like this. And just a warning, the next three slides are not going to be fun. Um, but they're going to be a little technical. But I think we really need to acknowledge the cost of our work. So I'm going to go through that. So this is a mine that's run by Imri's Performance Minerals out of Cornwall, England. And for all the potters out there, this is an open pit mine where your grow, your grow leg kaolin comes from. This is one of the most popular kaolins that's used in studio ceramics. Uh, mines of this size, they kill animals that used to live there. They destroy plant communities. They irrevocably change and pollute water tables. Mines also destroy the way that local people have interacted with these places for millennia. So, yeah, I mean, you can't really see it, but there's some giant trucks in there. I've, I've worked in mines in my life, and some of the trucks that are, look like tiny little specks in that picture, you can actually stand inside the wheel well. This is a giant operation. So let's just go through what that means. Um, after mining this material in that pit mine, it's processed by giant energy intensive factories, and it is then shipped over 11,000 kilometers. So it goes from United Kingdom all the way to Los Angeles, USA, it eventually ends up at a distributor in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So these distances are based on direct distances. The actual route is probably much longer and the carbon footprint will vary depending on whether they are shipped to the east coast of North America to then be transported by truck or rail, or whether they go to the west coast through the Panama Canal. Right. That's a long way. And then we're gonna, uh, yeah, Kaelin, fine, whatever. Minspar, this is the next one. So while Groleg Kaelin has a rather direct route, Minspar, which is mined by the rather ominous sounding Quartz Corporation, has a little more circuitous route. Um, so a lot of potters may not know that they use Minspar, but it makes up 70% what used to be sold under the trade name G200 Feldspar. Mine that produced this, the other 30% of it, not the 70%, uh, yeah, it got tapped out in the States in 2013 and G200 disappeared from the market. It caused a lot of potters a lot of problems with a lot of their glazes. So Minspar is still on the market today. It's mined in Spruce Pine, North Carolina. So you can see that on the map, it's the east coast of the United States. So this mine has released hydrofluoric acid into the North Toe River seven times in the last 40 years. It has decimated local trout populations, among other things. So after Minspar is mined, it is shipped to Drag, Norway. So you can see that up on the north side of Europe there. Yeah, so, um, so it's shipped up to Drag for processing. From Norway, it's shipped back to North America, which ends up at a wholesaler in Los Angeles before, in ship, before being shipped to a local distributor in Winnipeg. So once again, these are direct distances. Large companies really don't want to talk to anybody, including me, about how far they actually have to transport these minerals. So if Minspar is 
shipped directly, it travels 17,000 kilometers. Just for reference, the circumference, the total distance around the Earth is 40,000 kilometers. It's more than likely that this is traveling half the distance around the world to make our pottery. So these numbers are based on buying raw materials to begin mixing our clays and glazes. If you buy pre-made clays and glazes, you have added more links in the supply chain and you have added to ship incorporated water in your materials across these vast distances. As the weight of the water and the links in the supply chain increase, so does the associated carbon footprint. While I've looked at different materials, I would like to thank uh, Nicole Ham uh, for, she's from the Zula, Montana, for investigating this approach in her 2022 article, uh, Raw Material Roots, in the February edition of Studio Potter Pure article. She did some great work on this. Um, so people buy these materials in one form or another, and they make what they call local ceramics out of these materials. The history of these materials and the true cost of their production is obscured or willfully unacknowledged. There is a better way to make our art. Okay, so let's all take a breath because I'm that I just needed to get that out of the way and I'm not gonna browbeat that, but there is a better way to make our pots. So I've chosen to use not industrially produced materials on my work. I only use materials that I can dig myself so I know and can feel the impact of my actions. As you have said in the intro, I grew up in Brandon, Manitoba. I've been going to these places that my materials come from since I could walk. These are not strip mines. I care about these places and I would not stand for them being destroyed. That said, I want my work to be a celebration of the places that I inhabit. I have lived in a lot of different places and this is where I'm from and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. My pots have a story and they have a specific place. I want to honor that place, and it's the place that I call home. So I've always been a lover of the outdoors, uh, exploring the world around me. Um, after high school, I traveled for a few years and ended up moving to Vancouver to attend Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver. Um, that's where I began my research into local materials and ceramics. At first I was harvesting glaze materials in Vancouver. And so I was, I was an urban kid. So just working in the city, going to school. At first I was, there was an endless supply of broken glass from car windows, uh, decaying concrete curbs. And there was an endless supply of wood ashes from fancy restaurants with their pizza ovens. So I was trying to work locally. Um, but I started to see the where I wanted to go and where I wanted to go was back into the mountains and knowing that I was coming back to Manitoba at some point. So later in my degree, I began to explore the mountains and islands, uh, the granites from the Kootenays, uh, seashells from Galliano Island, surface clays from the Okanagan. In those days, I constantly had a trowel in my back to pack in a couple sturdy bags. Um, I was always taking samples. I always had the ball mills running at school. There was always one new experiment or two or ten. And the only reason I used the electric kilns was to calcine different rocks so I could break them down easier. Spent my spare time on the wheel during the week. And on the weekends, I was out of town firing and building kilns with friends. So I spent my winters in Vancouver and my summers out on Galliano Island doing a four summer apprenticeship with a potter named Sandra Dolph. So this is the kick wheel that I built um, on Galliano. Um, this is the kick wheel shaft and bearings that Sandra got 
from Germany from her teacher when she apprenticed and she passed it on to me when I successfully finished my apprenticeship. So this was a broken kick wheel out back of the studio, rust pitted, bearings were trashed, built the whole thing up, built a whole base for it, poured the concrete pad. I had no money and it was, it was great. I threw outside underneath a tarp. It was, it was absolutely lovely. Um, I didn't go inside that studio for four months and at a time and just, I just threw pots and yeah, there's something to be said for making do with what you have. And that was what Sandra taught me. So my apprenticeship with Sandra was just not about pots, which is what I was learning in school. She taught me the other parts of this is what it was to be a production potter and how to grow food, how to live a simpler life. This woman was amazing. Um, she raised two kids as a single mom on a potter's income. And she is the definition of true grit in my mind. If you don't know her work, look her up. She's not exactly Insta savvy, but yeah, she's an amazing person. She taught me a lot about building, repairing, making do. I made her standard wear. I glazed it, fired it, packed it for shipping and took care of the showroom uh, during the day. This is when I began to have an idea of how much work it was to be a full-time potter. Uh, this was a great apprenticeship. Uh, apprenticeships are very different than being school trained. I think both have their benefits and both have their fallbacks. I'm glad I did both. So up until this point, I had been working on small batches of local materials at school. Uh, when Sandra was looking to make new liner glaze with her standard wear after an industrial material was no longer available, I got to test my ideas. I dug 50 pounds of clay uh, about 100 meters out back of the studio or the side of a hill. I dried it, slaked it, sieved it, and tested it with the addition of, I think it was 2% iron oxide. I made a lovely Temiku glaze that pulled to a persimmon red on the edges. Um, the only problem was that when we crunched the numbers, my labor had doubled the cost of her liner glaze. So I just want to make sure at the beginning, everyone knows that working with local materials is not cheaper. Um, when I see a $20 mug, I see the exploitation of resources and I see a lack of respect and the valuing of the labor that has created it. These things cost money, they cost labor, and you're, if you're not valuing that labor, you're exporting that valuation to somebody else and you're taking advantage of somebody else. So I finished my degree, finished my apprenticeship, and after a few more years of traveling overseas, I returned to Manitoba and I found a piece of land in the Manitoba Interlake. Uh, it was everything I could have dreamed of. Um, I was completely in love. Uh, the first year I only camped on the land, watching drainage, checking soil types, identifying plants and watching how it changed those seasons. One of the things that I think is important in the work that I do is working with nature in a conscientious way. If I had gone to this land and done what I imagined initially, I would have destroyed massive amounts of native plants, uh, wildflower patches that support monarch butterflies. I would have cut off uh, trails that are used by deer and moose to move through the area at different parts of the season. and what I thought would be my perfect house site would have been actually in the middle of a giant puddle every spring. This year's observation let me know the, let me know this place instead of projecting my vision onto the place without listening to what it had to offer. And I think that's you know, something you're going to see coming back through this presentation is not looking for something, but 
trying to listen to what the things have to offer. I hope you get that anyway. So after that year, I went to work. Um, I had some crazy hippies helping me. Um, and yeah, um, I learned from the people that came up to help and they learned from me. We spent as much time as we could up in that place and we learned from it. We cut the trees with hand saws. Uh, we stripped the bark by hand with draw knives and it gave us time to think about the changes we were making to the biome and what those changes meant. So that's how we built all the buildings. We just cut trees down, stripped them down, drag, drag them out of the bush with straps and ropes and yeah. So yeah, obviously my interest in local extends beyond pottery. It's the buildings, it's the foraged food, and it's the animals that I hunt. There's me <laughs> doing some of the sketchiest building you've ever probably seen. So 10 years later, um, we are still growing and foraging even more of our own food. Um, this is me harvesting garlic with a uh, little sister, Christina, on the left, and my partner, Rachel, of Rachel Craker Ceramics on the right. Uh, this is over 200 garlic that we harvested that year. We're up over 500 right now. We've got lots of storage crops, um, lots of greens, lots of perennials like rhubarb, apples, berries, teas, medicinal plants. Uh, we harvest a lot of wild foods from the bush, uh, Saskatoon, cranberry, choke cherry, strawberry, mushrooms, cattails, spruce tips, nettles, burdock, clover, hazelnuts, acorns. I'm not going to keep going. That's enough of a list. Uh, this is my friend uh, Julie on the left and my friend Graham on the right. So I built kilns in BC um, with Cam Stewart and Monique Provost. So down in Point Roberts, just across the border from Vancouver down in the States. And Monique's kiln was up in around Pemberton in the bush up there. And so, yeah. I built them out of brick and things like that. So when I got back to Manitoba, I was looking at building locally. So I found a fired clay that I could dig and dry and slake and put in between these straw bales with a tarp in it and slake it down, add a bunch of sand to it that we also dug from our Ansuris. And then I could just shove a couple of hippies in there to stomp it worked well. So then after it's slaked, I would add straw to that mix. This is anybody that's into natural building. This is your standard cob mix. Um, I was definitely doing a lot more straw than your normal cob mix because it was a burnout material, but it gave me a good amount of green strength for my shrinkage on the whole kiln. So let's see. I am wearing pants in that picture. Um, so yeah, you just take that clay, mix it up with straw, stomp it with your feet, and then raw builds without any sort of bricks. This is, I was building a lot of groundhog kilns for people that know kilns at this time. Um, yeah, so really low walls, wide, thin arches, and yeah, just building it by hand like that. And then so you can see you got the sidewalls up, got the top of the roof on, and I do a light clay straw mix as an insulation layer with the straw as a burnout material. Uh, stone buttressing on either side. Once again, this is all stuff from the edges of fields that people have pulled out of the fields over generations so they can grow their field crops. Unfortunately, not every experiment works. So I fired this for a couple of years. Uh, there were structural issues with the roof cracking that 
fire clay was good, but it just didn't quite stand up. So it was fun. I mean, built a couple kilns out of stuff that I just harvested out of a hundred mile radius of my land and got some good pots out of it, but moved on from there. So I moved on to brick. Um, I was using, I still am using a uh, secondhand brick that's been reclaimed from boilers and old factories around Winnipeg. Um, there's some salvage companies around that'll pull all that down. I just go pull it out of the brickyard and pay them a bit. But yep, yeah, so this is all secondhand brick. Um, Burry box kiln with a few minor alterations to the burry to try and make it more efficient. And yep, yeah, same same kiln shed, just different hole in the roof. And I reused all the lo local clay from the first kiln that was in the topping layer, and I built put a cob layer over top of the brick, just trying to try and seal out some of those air holes and create an insulation layer because I was dirt poor, didn't have any money, so I as well make my own insulation. So I had the first 10 years back here, I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't know the local clay community in Manitoba at all. And I just wanted to be in the bush alone doing my thing. And then I started meeting people and I started, yeah, figuring out how much knowledge and support was out there. And I haven't looked back like this, this community in Manitoba wood fires is absolutely amazing. They are so giving, um, so willing to help. I kick myself for not doing it sooner. I've learned so much from Micah Still, uh, Dave Crindle, and Alan Lakovetsky. They are wealths of knowledge who are just so giving. They also take, but it's good. Um, and I still fire with all the friends that helped me build those original kilns. Um, I remember one of my favorite stories is when I actually started talking to people in the community, I ended up at a show with somebody who teaches ceramics at U of M and I, I'd started coming out into the community and just talking to people and people were curious about what I was doing. And this professor was, this professor asked me, where are you from? Like, it's like, I loved it. It was great. I was like, yeah, no, I've just been in the bush for 10 years just doing it. And I think that's when people ask how I do this is you just do it. No one's going to give you this. No one's going to tell you how it's done. You just have to go do it yourself. And the community is great for support, but sometimes they'll tell you what you're doing is crazy and you just have to keep going. So the other part of wood firing is harvesting wood. Um, I have a 40 acre wood lot and most of it's dead standing that I harvest. There's another farmer's field that I pull from. And so poplar is great. It's a, it's a weed tree. So you cut it down, it comes right back up. It grows up way too thick. So like three quarters of a stand will die. And, in those early years, I could just walk in and just push trees over. It was so easy. So nice. The other way I get my wood is I've got a lot of friends that I know that are farmers. Um, so tree the poplars grow into the edge of their fields. They can't have that. Otherwise, they wouldn't have fields to grow food for us. So when we go out, we cut down trees, pull it off to the side of the field, let it dry for a year, and then I haul it up to the kiln and burn it. So, yeah, I consider that to be sustainable. Um, this is not, it's very different than carbon that would be stored in oil and gas. Um, I still maintain a good forest cover. I don't take 
any more than 2% of my forest a year, which allows for regrowth and I move my cuttings throughout that area. So yeah, I'll argue with anybody that that's sustainable, that's fine. So now we get into local clay. This is, so now we've got through how I got the land, how I fire my pots. This is my local clay. Um, really great teachers out in Vancouver who were really helpful. Uh, Dar Darcy Margison and Tam Irving were really helpful. A um, couple books that never met him, but yeah, he was, I would still consider him Someone that I refer to a lot was Gordon Hutchins. And yeah, so looking at geological maps, um, Geological Survey of Canada, if anybody's interested in doing this, is a great resource. Uh, a lot of geologists are really helpful. I uh, took a couple of courses on geology at UBC as my electives instead of doing the science and art courses that were offered at Emily Carr. Um, so this is an isopack map. Um, this is the way you do it. It's how you find out where the where the substrate comes up and pushes through your top layers of overburden so that you're not removing 25 feet to get down to some sort of decent clay in this area. It's different in other areas. Uh, we're a glaciated area here. All of our lovely clays have been pushed down to the states. Um, anybody that's down in the northern states, I still want my fire clays back. Those are ours. Give them back. Kidding. Um, yeah, but prairies have great clays, and there's a lot of different rocks here as well that I can make glazes out of. So I don't just wander off into the woods and find something like a lot of this is research. Um, a lot of these geological survey maps will have what the different materials are, their chemical constituents. I don't necessarily rely on these. It's, it gives me an idea of where to look. Um, these are vast, geological deposits, they're not going to adhere to these chemical formulas that are on the screen right now. Uh, I've, I've never tried to plug these into a glaze calculation. It just, it doesn't work for me. I, I can't get it close enough. I'd rather test in different ways. Um, one of the things I would say about if anybody is looking in Manitoba, watch out for gypsum and a lot of carbonates. There's a lot of ground gypsum in your clays. You really need to slake them and then sieve them. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of pop outs. Uh, if you're also looking at doing this, learn how to read section township range calculations for like where things are located. It's how you actually find the stuff. Use Google Maps to figure out where the cuts are. So, like, did somebody drink, you know, dredge out a cattle watering hole? Can you get to the under layers of the soil through there instead of trying to find a stream that cuts through the area? Yeah, it just remember how variable these deposits are and just don't trust some of these numbers. A lot of the materials here, so I don't know what people are firing to, but I fire cone 11, 8 to 11, uh, just depending. But a lot of the stuff in this area can be single material fired for glazes. Uh, clay bodies are different. You're going to need, you're going to need to find, there's a few fired clays and stoneware clays in Manitoba, not many. You need a lot of silica sand things like that. But, uh, but if you're looking at glazes, a lot of the stuff around here can just single material fired up to a glaze temperature, no problem. Most of it will be greens, browns, but 
once you start getting into it more, you can find some things that aren't going to give you those colors. You're going to be grinding some hard rock, which I'm getting into now. But yeah, the last 10 years, I've just been using two materials in my glazes. That's it. Well, it's a clay and an ash, and depending on the ash, depends on the color. But So all that leads to possible materials. And the only way you really know if these materials are gonna work is you have to go test them. So this is one of my favorite clays. Um, it's actually the main constituent, probably 80%, 85% of my clay body. And it makes up the base of most of my glazes. And yeah, so first time I was out there, picked up some of this material, poured a little water in my hand, rolled it up, wrapped a coil around my finger. How did that do? Was like, oh, not bad. It's not cracking too much around my finger. Sounds like some good plasticity there. Looked at it, so eh, there's a couple of limestone chunks that are pretty big. I can probably sieve that out. How variable is the deposit? Well, I went and dug a couple holes in different areas. Looked pretty good, pretty standard. Took different tests from different areas, put them through the test kiln, and yeah, they looked pretty similar. So yeah. The other question is, who owned the land? Um, that was a big one. And do not go out and start digging holes in people's land, that's going to make you a whole lot of enemies. Um, yeah, the this, this material is good. So I, I looked at some geological reports, knew where this clay was, knew what I wanted. Couldn't find this guy's number at all. Knew who owned the land, couldn't find how to get in contact with him. So I just drove up there one Sunday night. Um, and drove up to the front of his house and knocked on the door. It was, I did not like doing it, but yeah, he thought it was nuts. So it was fine. It's like, hey, I want to go dig some of that clay out of the side of your ditch over there. And he's like, oh, I'm about to eat supper. You can do whatever you want over there. It's like, okay, great. Came back next year and, and I'd done my testing. This was the clay that I wanted. Came back next year. I was like, here, here's the pot. I was like, this is made out of your land. Sort of gave me a look. I was like, oh, oh, I remember you. Okay. That's, that's crazy. I was like, gave him the pot. And I was like, I was like, I want a little bit more clay. He's like, okay. Went and took a bit more clay, came back the next year. I was like, there's two pots. Now he was interested. So now every year that I go take clay from him, I have to give him pots. But he's become so interested in the idea of like what I'm doing and that it's from the place that he's from. He understands this. This is not somebody that would normally be interested in pottery, but he understands what it is to have something from a place. And I, I actually don't give him enough pots anymore. So now he buys pots from me on top of what I give him because he's become interested in it. And I think that's something about this that it can draw people in these, these stories of place and stories of resonance and where we're from. And it, it draws people in. And I think that's really important to remember. Also, I'm very careful about where I dig my clay from on his land because God forbid I create any erosion out of his fields and he runs cattle in that area. And if I put holes in his field that break his cattle's legs, I would never get clay back from that land again. So if anybody's interested in doing this, get permission and do not cause erosion and do not cause leg traps.
so most clays need modification for making a clay body, but a lot of the clays that we have here in Manitoba don't need a lot of modification if you're firing cone 10 for glaze materials. This is from uh, the side of the road up around the old family farm um, down in southern Manitoba. It's this is a glaze by itself. It's yeah, this runny green with like yellow speckles in it. It's 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 an it looks like an ash glaze. It just turns out it's a surface clay. Um, but when I'm doing my clay bodies, if I need to get more, if they, if they're shrinking too much, then I'm adding a silica sand, which is from a different area of the province, and I can find fire clays that are, have absolutely no plasticity here, and I can add them to my ball clay so I can get a bit, bit more of that firing range and like decrease some of that plasticity. So yeah, my clay body is three different materials from Manitoba. My glazes are usually one of those materials with wood ash added. But everything from here, 100%, no colorants, done. That took a decade. It makes it sound easy, but. Um, so some people ask me, how do you do this? Is like, I actually just really like testing. Um, if you, you have to test this, that's what this is. My partner hates that I have so many like buckets of random things constantly on the table, drying or slaking or sieving, but that's what I do. So my okay. testing regime starts with a cone test. So I make a cone of the material. I see how it melts. That tells me generally what the firing range is on it. Then I'll create a bar test if it's a clay. And that'll tell me my shrinkage, and I can do a boil test, test porosity uh, or absorption. And then I will start doing my line blends. Um, and once again, this is me looking at what the material offers me, not what I want. So there's a big difference there. Yeah, you just have to manage expectations. The next step is once I get done my line blends is I start doing uh, three point blends. And now that I'm getting a few more materials, I'm starting getting the hard rock. I'm actually getting into four point blends, which is actually for potters out there. It's a true triaxle. It's a four point blend. It's a triaxle, not what's on the screen. This is a biaxle. So this is how I process all my clays. Um, I drive a half ton truck up there with a shovel and buckets and dig it out. And then I bring it down to my kiln shed that's got cover on it. And I lay a tarp down so that it's not getting rained on. And I lay it out and I let it dry for a couple of weeks. And then I lightly crush it with my feet and just walk on it a bit. This is my super scientific scale. Um, yep, just put a standard weight in one bucket and then I weigh out my clay in the other. I, all my recipes are based on parts. So nine parts of one material, one part of another, half part of another, or something like that. I'm not gonna tell you my recipe, but, and then I just have a, old clawfoot bathtub full of water and I dump all that dry clay in there and let it slake. Always add dry to wet, never wet to dry, like you see on Instagram. So those people don't know what they're doing. And then after that's slaked for a couple of weeks, I'll mix it up and I will dump it through screening. Um, just window screen, uh, metal window screen, Put together with a few pieces of two by four and then i've got window screen on a stand and then underneath that is a piece of just a canvas with edges held up so that it holds it and the con 
the patio stones, concrete, whatever is underneath it, soaks that moisture out of it, give it another week, usually cover it over top so it doesn't get leaves or bugs in it. And then I've got a workable clay body. And I mean, it takes the whole summer, but I can generally process in, if I, if I take the whole summer, it's drying, waiting times, takes the whole summer. It's usually about two, three days of actual work, but I can process 1,600 pounds of clay, no problem. Easy. But yeah, so that screen is going to pull out a lot of your gravel, um, any sort of plant bits, leaves, roots, that sort of stuff, and the bent night. Uh, there's bent night inclusions that we have up here, so it's just little gummy bits that I don't really want my clay. I've got tons of shrinkage in that clay already, so I want that bent night gone. And so, yeah, I usually process 600 pounds at a time. Um, it's really hard to wedge, but this is not how you wedge it. You do not elbow drop. 600 pounds of clay. It's just fun to sit on top of sometimes. This is how you process it. Um, the batches that come off the canvas are not consistent. The edges are drier. The center is wetter. Uh, I like to cut it apart into the thin one inch sheets um, just to make sure that there's nothing in there. It's nothing worse than pulling rocks out when you're trying to throw in the wheel. So and then you mix it. So you take a whole stack, cut, 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 cut. And then you lay it out into four different piles, take the next batch, and you just keep mixing it like that. And that's when I put it into storage. Um, so that's when I put it into storage. I prefer to age my clay for a year. I find it makes a huge difference in my plasticity. Um, I can throw a lot thinner. It'll stand a lot longer on the wheel if I can age it that long. So at any time, I should have 800 pounds of clay sitting under my wear shelves. And then I can throw. It's, it, yeah, everything from Manitoba and I can throw it on my kick wheel. It's no problem. It stands nice, throws good. I can adjust how much grog I want in it by wedging a bit more sand if I need it. I don't usually do that though. It's just, I like my clay the way it is. So that's my clay. So we've gone through firing, we've gone through clay, and now we're into glazes. So glazes are what I really enjoy experimenting with. This is my, yeah, bread and butter. So most of everything you find in Manitoba um, is going to be a glaze material. A lot of people at markets will say, for those of you who are in Manitoba, um, will ask me, oh, are you making your pots out of the stuff that, that clay that comes up on the edge of the Red River? And, and say no like that stuff that comes up on the red river like at the 1300 degrees celsius over 22 hours that stuff turns to puddle of black glass it's useless to me most of that stuff that you pull out of the river you're going to be lucky to get a cone for firing out of it it's it's terracotta if that um yeah Most of the natural materials that I use are surface clays. I've experimented with a lot of them. Uh, some of the materials that I use, uh, this one particularly, this is an old lime kiln site. So back in the day, they used to harvest, blow up all the limestone, put it into a lime kiln, burn the lime kiln, and they would take the lime out of that and then use that to make lime plaster. That's how you got your plaster walls and all the old houses and things. What this is, is this is a waste material. So this is combined wood ash 
with limestone waste that has had water precipitate through it for probably about a hundred years. So you've lost all of your fluxes, well, your soluble fluxes anyway. And so, yeah, this is, this is a spot that I get one of my materials from. I use it a little bit. It's just, I don't really like harvesting from waste sites, but, um, if anybody's looking at doing this, one of the things that you really need is you need large deposits. I can, I can burn a piece of wood and that piece of oak is great. That gives me a bit of ash. I can make a pot out of it. Fine. The problem is if I then take a piece of spruce, that is completely different. That ash is going to act differently. Now, if I take another piece of oak, well, that's going to act differently too, because like there's a different amount of heartwood, how much limb wood is in it, how much bark is on it. You really need large sample sizes. If I can't get 64 liters of a material, whether it's ash or clay, I'm, I'm not touching it. It's just, it's not worth my time to test it. So this is a commitment in space, but yeah, if you can find large deposits like this or other ones, you mix them together and then you test it and then you move forward. Um, oh, this, yeah. Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here. I do a lot of my stuff with ash. Um, anybody that's working with ash glazes, please, please be very careful. Um, when you have dry ash, it has lye in it. Um, lye is caustic. It's the old soap material that will dissolve your skin. And yeah, if you stick your hand in a whole batch of wet ash and try and mix it, there's a slippery feeling on your hands. That's your skin dissolving. So yeah, just learn what you're doing before you go and do it. It's, there's some dangers to it, but. That's me with a really devious look in my eyes. Um, so like I was saying, different ashes have different properties. So trees will give you one thing. So oaks will have more silica. They're very hard wood. Whereas you get spruce, uh, pine will give you a lot more iron. They pull up just more of that. Um, your poplars are going to be more phosphorus and potassium. And I was really looking for really high silica ash a few years ago and found out that grasses have, and grain crops have a lot of silica in them. So I just got some wheat bales of wheat straw off a neighbor and put some metal things up and got myself a tiger torch. And then I closed the whole thing up and shoved a tiger torch on the bottom of it, lit it on fire. And that's what happened. So we would just, it would just burn for a long time. Um, and then when the whole thing was half burned down, you just poke it with a piece of rebar and the whole thing would just flare up again. And when it was, Almost burnt down. You take another bale and throw it into the top of it, and that would light on fire. It was fun. Um, I'm pretty sure Cody, who's in that picture, lost a bit of his beard that weekend. It was a, it was a super low return on what I was doing. I didn't get a lot of ash out of it. Um, it was a fun experiment, but it just reinforced that I want to use things that are from the environment that's either somebody else is processing for me or that has already been processed in the past. I don't want to just start burning things for the sake of burning them to get the ash. It was, it felt wasteful to me. So it was good. I got some really nice glazes out of it. I just, I couldn't be bothered to burn eight, 10 bales of straw a year. It just, it felt wasteful. So, but 
these are the things you try. You see what's in your environment. And I would suggest that this is a lot less wasteful than shipping something 17,000 kilometers around the world. So this is one of my new materials that I'm working with. I'm pretty sure this is a dirty kale in Manitoba. Not many of those around. Glaciers scraped most of those off, but there was enough big mountains around hills, Manitoba hills, mountains, around this one that the glaciers sort of rode over top of this area. And I'm really excited about this one. Uh, it's the most refract refractory material I've found in Manitoba. Just because things aren't white doesn't mean that they're not refractory. Um, this is bright yellow, it's pretty refractory. One of my other most refractory materials is bright red. It just, it depends. You, you, if you're going to start working with local materials, you need a good handle on what your the chemistry of clays and glazes are um, and whether you're whether your impurities are iron or whether there are other things that are going to cause more flux in. So, you know, it's, it's not just wandering into the woods. You actually need a grasp on what you're doing. Unless you've got more time than I have, then you can just test everything. But good on you. So this is the other big part of what I do is I keep a ton of notes. Um, I have tested over 80 different local materials. It's really easy to lose track of what you've done and what you've tested and how you tested it. So typical first page of testing right here is notes. Um, availability, directions to it, cone tests, bar tests, absorption tests just and pictures of where it's from this is redbird clay this is downtown winnipeg just off west broadway it it's a great liner glaze um, at cone 10 small addition of wood ash and this is a cone 10 liner glaze it's nice So I want to make plots that have use value. So we've talked about the firing, we've talked about the clays, we've talked about the glazes, but what am I making out of these things? Function is a weird word. So like display is a function. I went to art school, whatever. Um, but I, I like my plots to have a use value. So this is a fermentation crock. My design has changed a little bit in the last couple of years. I like my pots to create food or provide food or provide nourishment. I'm a strong believer in the local food movement and the farm to table mentality. And I think we should expand that into how things are produced, not just in how they are presented. Like I said, it's a fermenter, beautiful object, preserves food, produces food. I've got weights, um, double fermentation lock, bubbler, um, a couple of local producers that made that. Pretty sure that's Origin Handcrafted that made that knife and Lincraft heirlooms that made that cutting board. So a couple of good guys. So I don't make plot pots just to be displayed. Um, always, that's always bothered me. Um, you can present my, you can present food in my pots, but I definitely want them to be in a person's hands. I want the people to hold the pot and know the story, and then think about where that came from. And I want that to inform the other objects that are in people's cupboards or lives or whatever. So. If I've told you a story about a pot, where it came from, how it was produced, how much I cared about all those different impacts that that pot had, how does that inform all the other pots that are around it? 
were those considered in the same way? Why weren't they considered in the same way? This is the, this is the questions that I want my pods to ask. Anyway, I want people to, rem and a lot of time, people that buy my pods know the places that these things are from. So this is one of my poplar ash glazes. Um, oh, yeah, poplar ash glaze. It's a saddle bowl style that I've been making for years. I just like how the plasticity of the clay when I'm throwing, I can start to model it into different shapes. And I really like sets. I really like sets. They make me so happy when things fit together like that. Because I'm, I'm being very exacting. These things can look a little rough to people, but for them to know that like, no, I'm, I'm considering how much all these things shrink and warp and fire in the kiln, and then to have them fit just right, makes me really good. I have trouble leaving things around. I just, I've been throwing for 15 years now and I just, I like different shapes. So yeah, the way I square the top of those mugs, just shifting that circle is interesting to me. And it gives my hands something different to do on the mug. So I, I consider it more, not just pouring things in my mouth. I, I consider where I use that thing and how I interact with it. And this is a newer set. So that metallic surface is something I'm really working with, with reduction cooling in my kilns. I think it's a more efficient way to achieve some of these colors that doesn't use as much wood and doesn't produce as much small, fine particulate carbon, which is a problem. So yeah, really working with that a lot. <laughs> and then this is a bowl run that I did a couple of years ago with uh, applewood ash, just pruning this from apple trees, totally different color that was pulled out of that. That's for the glaze on the inside. So most of my work is made from the same three materials, um, just using different ashes to modify my glazes. And while I really enjoy experimenting with different local materials, I find that my most successful work comes from materials that I've gotten to know over the last decade. And I've gotten to know them. I know the people that have those areas that they take care of when they farm those areas. I know what those deposits look like and it's the experimentation and getting to know your materials over time and that's i think how i how i've been able to do this i'm about to close but i just want to close by saying that i was really pulling punches at the beginning of this talk like, while all industrial materials are a problem, I will never use common colorants like cobalt in my proper or pottery. I just I won't. I never use cobalt. And if you don't know why, then you really need to dig into why you're using these materials and how they're sourced, because it's generally horrifying. You need to do that research. And that's the only way that I get through this. It, this is a ton of work. And to get through that amount of work, you need to know why you're not doing the other thing. Because there's a point to this. I use 100% local materials in my pottery. So just, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, and if you are interested in going deeper, I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion right now and about how to source process and use local materials in your pottery. I'm running a seven hour workshop on May 1st, 2022. 
um, just email me or check the Instagram to register. I've got, it's a six spot course. There's only two spots left. Um, yeah, get in touch. And as a last photo, this is a bowl. Um, and the materials around it are what it's made from. And as much as I don't like the word sustainability, I don't just make work that's about sustainability. I'm trying to make work that's actually sustainable. Thanks for letting me speak. And yeah, Katrina. Hello. That was a hey. great talk, David. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I'm not a ceramicist, but I am someone who's interested in sustainability or, you know, uh, yeah. There's not very many good synonyms for it, unfortunately, right? But uh, a thing that struck me about your talk uh, and makes a lot of sense for the title you selected, which is sustainability as a process, as a practice, is that your life is very integrated into your creative practice. Also, I forgot to say this at the start, uh, please put any questions you have for David in the Q&A. Uh, and I'm just going to chat with him about my questions first, then I'll answer yours because there's a slight delay between us getting your switch on. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, or just, uh, your thoughts on if you, if your sort of lifestyle and your philosophy and your values have informed your ceramics practice, or if your ceramics practice and your apprenticeship sort of informed this lifestyle, or if those were sort of integrated together, or if they sort of formed together, because the thing that I really took note of when you were talking is about how like this, you're not just sort of digging dirt for your ceramics you're also like building your house with wood from the woods there's sort of a very like holistic full circle sort of aspect to all of this and i found that quite interesting cool yeah no um i when i went out to bc to start studying ceramics i actually chose ceramics because it was the thing that i could take back to basics the most mm -hmm. so I, I thought about like doing painting or sculpture, but as meh, I, I'm, I'm not going to start weaving my own canvases. I'm not going to go start harvesting my own pigments. Ceramics is the thing that I wanted. So it, it wasn't some sort of like hippy dippy love story, but I, I, I fell in love with the material, yeah, the materiality of the craft. And I'm, I'm, I'm running with it and I love it. Like I wouldn't want to do anything else. But I would say the ceramics came out of a history of environmental activism that I was a part of before that and wanting to live a certain lifestyle. At the same time, when I was in Vancouver, I mean, I, regional ceramics was, isn't necessarily just being in the bush. Like when I was in Vancouver, I was... I was harvesting broken window glass on Saturday morning on my way to school and like broken curbs. Like that was my, that was my regional specificity at that point in my life. Like the urban and, ecosystem. Yeah. Which was yeah. just a different ecosystem. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it was, it was fine. Like, and I mean, I did all the leachate tests and like making sure that there was no like cadmium or lead in that window glass and made sure that it was all functional ceramics and it was fine. But like, no, I, I I think that regionally specific ceramics can be from anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be a rural. Mm -hmm. I I just want to live a rural lifestyle. So so now I live in urban Winnipeg and still <laughs> want to live a rural lifestyle. Which will yeah, happen. absolutely. Hopefully happen soon. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a nice thing about living in Manitoba is that well, we do have this like. Well, I think big by Canadian standards, maybe like a medium sized city. Um, you're not very far away from rural areas and the province is largely rural, which is quite lovely because, you know, you can drive for like an hour and you're in a field somewhere. Oh, um, yeah. Unlike a lot of other places where, you know, you drive for an hour and you're still in the suburbs. I'm uh, pretty sure there's a couple of friends from BC on here who are going to hate me for saying this, but like, I hated Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> you, you couldn't i mean two hours of driving and like you'd be in a park where there was there was actually like a person on the bridge like with signs about whether you were allowed to cross the bridge because you were in a park and they couldn't have too many people on the bridge it's like this isn't nature what is yeah. wrong with people? 
rats. It's like um, the human rats are in a little maze or whatever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they obeyed the signs. <laughs> Well, they've been well trained. They pushed. So they the were well trained rats. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's great. Like I'm, I love being here. And there's, I think that's some a part of it that resonates with me is that I dig a lot of these clays from areas that I grew up, like either hiking or hunting or like wherever, like family farms. Is I I've known these places. I hate to admit it, for almost forty years of my life, and that's there's a resonance there and I, I wouldn't ever damage these places to make my pots mm -hmm. and i really wonder about people's ability to make pots from a place that they don't know that they're willing to damage mm, like the sort of yeah it's like um i think sometimes it strikes me that every like sandwich bag i've ever used in my life still exists i can't see it i just can't see it yep. you know like that, that feeling of like out of sight, out of mind. Like if I had to deal with my own sandwich bags, I might like think if everyone had to deal with their own sandwich bags, they might not use so many sandwich bags, you know? Uh, and I think with, like with all of our art practices, I feel like that is an element. It's like sort of all the garbage just disappears or you don't see the impact of your materials because they're coming from somewhere else. And it's it's hard to care about things that you can't see, I think, for a lot of people or like, or maybe you're not aware of what you're not seeing because I'm I'm not a ceramic ceramicist. I should start off by saying that, and I've never seen a clay mine before, <laughs> right? And then you show me the pictures, and I'm like, oh my gosh! But I like you know, but I've never thought about it. I'm just like, well, it's clay. It comes from the it comes from the ground. How how big of an impact can that really have? You know, yeah. but uh, apparently yeah. quite a large one. But the and, beauty of making something like ceramics is that in 50, like if you smash your, your bowl, not that we would ever want to do that, and it went into the ground in 100 years, it would just be the ground, right? And that's nope. kind of, or like it's going to return to the earth in shards and get smaller and smaller and not be a plastic mug you dig up from your garden like 300 years from now. But, you know, so and if, you've got, if you've got fired clay, you're you've basically made granite and you're mm. looking around 20 million years to turn that back into something that isn't a shard mm. it's it'll turn into sand in about 10 million but yeah. no it does not degrade well i guess the point i'm trying to make isn't so much that it'll turn into nothing but that the impact of it is very minimal if that returns back to its environment rather than like a it's plastic not a, it's bag. Not a plastic bag yeah. Be my fish. yeah you know right. it's yeah. like it's gonna like photodegrade and be in like little little fishy stomachs for the next like three million years or whatever and it'll become you know a very nice shelter for an animal or or something like that you know there's a beautiful element to that i don't see any questions rolling in but i think that might be because you had such a like lovely and comprehensive chat did I scare people? Is that what happened? I don't think you scared people. I think that you just, <laughs> I think that you were just very thorough. I've, I've learned a tremendous amount about ceramics tonight. <laughs> sure. yeah. And also, David, thank you so much for talking about this topic. Because I think as makers, and especially as craftspeople, we're quite aware of the fact that by making things, we are having an environmental impact. Like there's this sort of tension between uh, like wanting to create and also uh, not wanting to impact the environment around us. And I think you really, I think conversations like this are really helpful to see that there's, there are alternative, um, there are alternative methods. Oh, we have questions early in. I think we just had a delay. Um, <laughs> says, it seems we need to change the conversation about local means. What are some successful ways you've been able to communicate your making process with the general population? Great question. Um, it's it's hard. It's it's hard to communicate that with people who come to shows or even like doing the Insta social media thing that I'm horrible at. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's. If I can talk to people for five minutes at a show, I can tell them the like Cole's notes, quick, dirty, about what I do. 
but a lot of people just walk by because I mean, our, our attention spans are so messed. Like it, it, it's hard to get people's attention and tell them like, Hey, this, this thing actually like takes a bit of engagement. And I, I think that's, I think that's what my work is about though, is about slowing down and like thinking about like where stuff is from. So if, if people aren't able to engage for like the two minutes to like listen to what I'm doing, then they're, they're not my audience. And I'm, <laughs> then I'm dismissive of them and it's probably not the best thing to do, but. Well, I mean, I think your story about that man who you've been digging the clay on his land is a really great, like, uh, encapsulation of that. It's sort of like, by the sounds of it, he's not the kind of dude that you'd be, like, drinking a beer with on a Saturday night. But oh, no. He was, time, he was so annoyed with me the first time I yeah. got Because, like, he was trying to go and eat his, like, roast beef and drink his Budweiser. Like, he was yeah. just annoyed. But then, um, over time... You it took years. Of- passively educated him yeah. on what was happening right yeah and I think that's like a really beautiful like he didn't care until he did yeah and yeah. now like, now he's a friend like well yeah, yeah we text yeah. so yeah it's fine <laughs> um Brittany asks how has the higher cost of purchase been met same thing um there's some people that get it and there's some people that don't um I would say a lot of Insta potters and new people into the field don't value themselves properly. Um, yes. And I, it, that annoys me a lot. So I'm, I'm going to choose my words carefully on that one and say that like, yeah, I've, I've been doing this for 15 years now and it, the people that undercharge, they're not using that money to pay their mortgage. And that upsets me. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, Greg asks, as a potter, what is your favorite part of the process from harvest to finished piece? Ooh, great question. Uh, I'm a fire potter. Uh, so yeah, uh, there's a there's a lot of mud potters out there. Um, I mean, I, I love my testing, but Ooh, you get me in front of a wood kiln and 22 hours with friends and family around like stoking and having a few drinks around the kiln and getting a big stoked fire going. I love it. So that's firing the kiln is definitely my thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm a, uh, again, not a ceramicist, but I'm imagining it's like um, just the biggest, best campfire. <laughs> with with a year's worth of your labor inside of it yeah. so there's a very whole... precious moments i'm sure too because uh, <laughs> from what i've heard around ceramics have a tendency to melt and explode so i'm sure it's pretty nerve-wracking too it's nerve-wracking but yeah it's giver <laughs> yeah absolutely do you find like this is my own question yeah. uh, do you find that your clay has more issues with kiln kiln accidents or more more or less or about the same as like standard commercial clay uh definitely more accidents in the beginning as i was figuring out but now that i've got it figured out i mean yeah i i know how it reacts um i i fire my clay in my kiln i fire it down in micah stills kiln and like my clay reacts really well with his salt firings. I get a really nice surface on it. I know what that mm. surface is. I fired it in Alan Lakovetsky's kiln. It, it doesn't get such a good firing out of his, but he's got a new kiln. <laughs> I'm curious to see it out of his now. I, I know what my, it was bad at the start, but mm. now that I've gotten to know my ingredients, now I know how it's going to react. So, yeah. Well, absolutely. And since you're digging it from the ground, I'm sure there's like, um, the additional, like, you can't just look up what cone to fire it at and all of that sort of deal. It's all, it's all trial and error because even if people are doing similar things and you can kind of lean on what they're doing, they're, they're probably not doing it in the exact place you're digging your clay. Right. So there's always that, like, that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's how they fire their kilns, whether they're doing oxidation reduction or like what they're adding to it for atmospherics. And yeah, it's, but yeah, no, it just, it's, 
yeah, a decade of working with the same materials gives you an insight into what you're dealing with. So, yeah. And I think that there's an element, like I've not an element I find between lots of craftspeople is really enjoying the like iterations and the tinkering and the sort of refining, refining, oh, yeah. refining, refining, and then like telling everyone what you've done. And then they tell you what they did and then you like trade and then you like refine, refine. Uh, and there's like this generosity of information sharing among craftspeople I find because we're all just like trying to get to the ultimate. I don't know what that ultimate is, but everyone's just like sharpening that like more and more and more. And uh, I think that's really what the talk you've shown us tonight has been showing us your like 10,000 hours or whatever it is, but more probably more like, you know, 100,000 hours, your iter <laughs> iterations, iterations and um, kind of the like alchemy science part and all of this sort of, um, and like, and you're sort of like marching up that hill and now you've gotten to this sort of like beautiful end result that comes from the land that we all like live and eat on. And there's that sort of like beautiful work. Oh God, please don't tell me this is the end result. I've still got a few years left. Well, in you're in a, at an at a result. But uh, there, there are cultures around the world that believe if you create something perfect that you'll die. So they master craft people start like putting these little airs in where you can't see them. So I think that, you know, there's always more to be to be learned. But there's you've gotten to a really um, a really like fantastic result now. You know, there's that sort of like, yes, like when I see your bowls, they don't look like they've been dug from dirt in Manitoba. Like, you know, you don't you see a beautiful refined product. You don't see. Um, you don't see sort of what people I think would imagine as a ceramic that's made from dirt here. You know, we right. I think that the average person is imagining this sort of like clunky, ugly thing. I'm a textiles person. So I think when people think like Manitoba te made textiles, they're picturing like ugly, slubby yarn or something. And, uh, but really you can get these really nuanced, beautiful things. Um, Crystal, so when can we expect Dave's Manitoba clay to hit the sounding stone shelves? <laughs> Sorry, never. 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 <laughs> no, sorry. I I'm more interested in selling myself and yeah, um at craft fairs and you'll definitely see me not this year, but next year on the Interlake Wave tour. Um but yeah, nope. <laughs> well, and I think I feel like you maybe feel I feel like people have to maybe they have to go out and dig their own clay to get the Dave Manitoba clay experience. <laughs> Come take the workshop. Yeah, go take the workshop. Um, so thank you so much for your talk today, Dave. And Dave's David's website is in the description. So if anyone's interested in taking his fantastic clay clay workshops, uh, you can find his info there. Thank you, Dave. Have a great night. And thanks, thank you so much and thanks everybody else for asking the questions and listening to my insanity. <laughs> <laughs> With pleasure. <laughs> Have a great night.